Thanks for joining us here at Temple Baptist Church in Centralia, Illinois, where we are a community of people who are not perfect and don't pretend to be. If you would like to see other resources or learn more about our ministry, check out www.tbccentralia.com. Our hope and prayer is that through the following message, you are encouraged, blessed, and inspired to meet the Lord in a powerful way. Leading up to today, and the first thing is that I keep saying each week, and that is this, don't take my word for it. Matter of fact, I would like for you to doubt every word that comes out of my mouth and go and find it and prove it for yourself. The scripture tells us in two different places. In Acts 17, it it, um, lauded the church, the Berean church, and it said that daily they checked on what the apostles had taught them. And so one of the mechanisms that that we've got going on right now is Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. You can join us for a Bible study called Going Deeper. And I would encourage you, if you have that availability, come and see and dig deeper into this topic. Uh, The second is 2 Timothy. And it tells us in 2 Timothy that we are to study to show ourselves approved. You know, it is not... One day you'll stand before uh, God and it's not going to be what I said that he holds you accountable to. It's going to be what you did with what was said. It's going to be what you did with what the Word of God says to us. And so I would encourage each of us study to show ourselves approved. The second thing I uh, want to tell you every week is it's all about context. You know, the way that we look at the, the scriptures about eschatology, about the end times, changes. What we saw or thought we saw or understood in um, 1980 has changed dramatically. What we see in 2019, if the Lord tarries, will look radically different in 2040. And so we need to understand that the context of the way that we are looking at things will change as time goes on. But what is interesting is what God said didn't change. It will always be true. Just the way that we understand it uh, is what changes. And then the third piece of advice I give you is this, that we need to seek the whole counsel of God. While I'll be today, for the most of the day, be in the book of Revelation in chapter 13, uh, I want you to understand that we don't just need to rely on the book of Revelation. You're going to hear me quote a lot of passages, a lot of different verses throughout the, the Bible today. And remember this, that even though there's 66 books, it's one message. And that's what makes the Bible so powerful you know um the first week i talked to you about a concept called the fullness of the gentiles and last week i introduced you to the 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 subject of the rapture and and when the fullness of the gentiles is reached when that number of the church gets saved the father is going to tell his son go get him bring your church And I believe as scripture has showed us that there will be a door that opens in heaven that we'll be able to see Jesus, we'll hear a trumpet, and you'll hear your name called. Come here. Well, the reality is that not everybody's name is going to be called. Not everybody will take advantage of this church aid, this parenthesis in time that God has established. You, You see, the church has been injected supernaturally into history. It started at Pentecost. Not only that, but it has been maintained supernaturally throughout the years. And you know that Satan has tried to destroy the church all along the way. But every time that he tries to to, to quell the church one area, it comes up stronger in another area. That's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then one day the church is going to be removed supernaturally. And that is when the fullness of the Gentiles is reached. And what happens is that the restrainer will no longer restrain. The Holy Spirit who has been working through the church, he is going to be uh, removed with the church. Now, Now stay with me, the Holy Spirit will still be here on earth. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, he is uh, omnipresent, but what he has been doing in restraining will be halted. You know, and what's interesting is when we read that, we may not see exactly what is being restrained. But when he's not here anymore and he's not restraining, it will be undoubted to anybody what he used to do. 
Because when the Holy Spirit stops restraining, Satan will start to bring his plans to a head. Now, the scripture tells us that, um, think about the days of Noah. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that as in the days of Noah it will be. And remember that Noah preached for 120 years. We, as uh, preachers of the word, the apostles, since they have been on the scene, it's been almost 2,000 years that the message of salvation is being preached. And just like in the days of Noah, only a few people, only a small percentage of the population will be saved. If you, uh, if you have your note taker, if you look, I put a timeline graphic on there, and I kind of just want to go through that graphic with you. Just so you have a, a little bit better understanding of what is happening. And so um, if you look at the far left of that, you will see that uh, there is an announcement called a decree. And I'm going to explain this in just a few minutes. And then in between the, the decree and the next thing is Calvary, or actually what you probably want to write there is that Jesus presented himself as the king, the Messiah. And I wrote a number there, 173,880, and that is the number of days that the Bible tells us that would happen before from the time of the decree until the time that Jesus presents himself as the Messiah. Well, uh, immediately after that, Jesus was crucified on the cross, and you have Calvary. And from Calvary until the time of the Gentiles' fullness, that is where we're at right now. This is an interval, and I'm going to show you exactly that God uh, talked about this. But when this happens, when the rapture happens, when the, the number is reached and God calls us home, he has some work to finish with the nation of Israel. And so the concept here is called Daniel's 70th week. You know, uh, while we were um, meeting this past um, Tuesday, I shared with the group of, out of the book of Ezekiel 38. And, and one of the things that gets a, a pastor excited, especially one who is uh, interested in eschatology and end times, is the book of Ezekiel 38. Because in the book, it talks about a, a four, four nations along with a few others, but four very specific nations that are going to come against Israel. And those four nations are Russia, Iran, Turkey, and Germany. And what's interesting is two of those nations I just mentioned are in a, a group called NATO. But Russia's not in that group. And if you would have looked at, since the 1980s, uh, as, as you study this, it, you always, we try to explain away. All right, now, so let me give you two fancy words. One is called exegesis. Exegesis is where you take what God says and you pull out exactly what he says. Then there's another word called eisegesis, and what happens is we kind of try to take what's going on today and squeeze it into what the words say. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that there is many a pastor that read Ezekiel 38, and when they saw Germany, they tried to fudge it a little bit. It was, well, you know, it's not Germany, you know, maybe it was Poland, because at that time Poland was part of the Warsaw Pact. Or they'll um, see that it said Turkey, and they go, well, maybe it's not Turkey, and then they'll try to stretch those lines. I'm here to tell you that God's word is very, very clear. He, he leveled out in uh, Genesis chapter 10 where um, these nations would go to. These are all sons of Noah, and he identified them very clearly. And Russia, Iran, Turkey, and Germany. And now, if you pull up the headlines, you'll find out that right now Russia has a military force in Syria that would spin your head if you knew how many were there. In the last few years, over 160,000 Russian soldiers have served there. And there's over 100,000 there right now. Iran, well, you don't have to go very deep into the headlines, and you'll see that uh, Iran has some very clear intents, and she wants nothing more than to destroy the nation of Israel. Turkey. Just last Monday, Turkey started receiving a shipment of S-400 missiles uh, that they purchased from Russia, a NATO country buying weapons from Russia. I don't know if you've noticed this, but over the last eight years, Turkey has been uh, pulling themselves out of this NATO pact. And don't be surprised one day when you see these four nations aligned completely. The one that really should get you excited in 2019 is to see what Germany's doing. Germany is uh, right now signing an agreement with Russia 
for an oil pipeline. Now, you know that Germany has opportunities to get that oil from other places. But I think it's that we see God's word being fulfilled through Ezekiel 38 right now. And I believe what we see in Ezekiel 38 is going to happen sometime between the rapture, the time of the Gentiles' fullness, and the beginning of what we're going to call, and I'm going to share with you today, of Daniel's 70th week. So let me say a little more about Daniel's 70th week. It's in the book of Revelation, if you read chapters 6 through 19, all of those chapters are talking about Daniel's 70th week. It's essentially design, uh, detailing what happens during this period. But uh, turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9, and I'm just going to read four verses to you, and I want to kind of break down these verses and share with you, because these four verses talk about Daniel's 70th week. And it says this in verse 24. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. What people is he talking about here? He's talking about the Jewish people. What city is he talking about here? He's talking about Jerusalem. And it says that uh, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression. You see, Israel had decided to rebel against God. God had told them, every seven years you need to set a year aside where you don't work the land, where you give everything back to God, where you restore those who've lost. But Israel decided that was just too big a price. And they said they weren't going to do it. Well, Israel quit counting those years. God didn't. And God said, I'm going to get every one of those years back. And this is where he's laying this out. And he says to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity. To bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal both vision and profit. And to anoint a most holy place. Verse 25, he now defines. Verse 24, identified 70 weeks. Now he's going to do the math for us. Know therefore and understand that from the going of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. And now listen, then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and a moat and in troubled time. Now, what's interesting is that God gives us this very specific mathematical prophecy. You know, you may not realize this, but the Jewish calendar is different than ours. Ours has 365 days a year, and then we have a leap year built in there. They have operated off of a 360-day year from the beginning. Uh, they operate off of a solar calendar, not one of the sun. And so when you start doing the math and you multiply um, 69 weeks, which is the 7 weeks plus the 62 that he just mentioned, you'll come up with 1, 000, or 173,880 days. And so, in effect, the angel Gabriel has now given Daniel a very clear prophecy. The commandment to restore and build Jerusalem was given by uh, our Texas, and it was done in March 14th in 445 B.C. And if you go forward, you'll see that Jesus presented himself as king on April 6th, 32 A.D. It's amazing the precision with which prophecy is laid out. And the reason why that he puts it here in Scripture is God wants you to know that he is God. He has control over this. No matter how dire the circumstance looked, and, and when he's doing this, Israel was in captivity. And he's given this promise. Let's read verse 26. And now it defines the interval which we are in. And after 62 weeks, and you're adding the 62 plus the 7, 69 total, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And what it's saying there is that Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah, gained nothing from his death on the cross except the church. He didn't deserve it. He shouldn't have been the one on the cross. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Now, if you look at the slide, I've got some math on there for you. And you see very clearly the, the date of March 14, 445 B.C. And if you go to March 14, 32 A.D., you'll come up with 173,740 days. If you add March 14, 32 A.D. to April 6, 32 A.D., you're going to get 24 more days. 
And then if you will compensate in there for the uh, amount of leap years in between these two, there's 116. Put that all together and you come up with the same number that God gave, and that's 173,880 days. Don't believe me? Go ahead and start getting your calculators out and, and doing the math. And then verse 27, it tells us about the 70th week. In verse 27, he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of the abomination shall come one who makes desolate. Now, I shared with this to, with you in week two, that there is the Israel is going to build a new temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. And they are going to start the practice of sacrifices again. Now, it's hard for us to understand that as 2019 Christians, why would they reinstitute the sacrifice that's been taken care of? But we know that Israel has never accepted the Messiah. And they still believe in their heart that they have to make atonement. They still believe that there's a Messiah coming, not realizing that they missed it. And this guy that makes a covenant, which becomes the 70th week, says he'll, at, after a half of that week, he'll put an end to the sacrifice. Now, one of the things that's interesting, and it just takes a little bit of study to show yourself approved, you'll find out that when they say a week, they're talking about a week of years. So that there's seven years. When it talked about 70 weeks, it talked about 70 times seven years. And so 483 of those years have been accounted for. One week is still coming. It's the final week. It's the culmination of everything that, that we will read here in Revelation. This is what leads to Israel's fullness. Where Israel as a nation will recognize God. They will recognize that they missed the Messiah. And they will cry out to Him for help. In the last words it says, Until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. You know, this is one of those verses where you can say, I read the back of the book and we win. You know, there's nothing better than having recorded a game that you're interested in on TV and be able to speed through the commercials. Matter of fact, if, you're, if you can't wait and you don't want to watch the whole game, you can go all the way to the end and see the victory. Well, that's what's going to ha has happened for us. We see the victory. And the reason why we need to see this is because bad times are on the way. Matter of fact, if you read through Scripture, it identifies this week in a lot of different names. The one we just saw here was Daniel's 70th week. If you look in Daniel 12, 1, he calls it a time of trouble. If you look in Revelation 6, verse 17, it calls it the great day. In Revelation 3 and 10, it calls it an hour of testing, where the whole earth will be tried. In Isaiah 26 and verse 26, it's called the indignation. In Joel 1.15, it's called the day of the Lord. Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22, identified it as the great tribulation. It says, for then, and this is Matthew 24 and 21, for then shall be great tribulation. And now what's interesting is uh, what he's talking about is if you go a few verses forward, he's talking about the um, abomination of desolation. And what happens here is that this person who establishes a covenant with Israel, who after one half of that covenant, three and a half years, he decides to stop the sacrifice that he allowed them to do, and he goes in and he proclaims himself as God. And he does this, and he sets his throne up in the Holy of Holies of the new temple, the third temple. And here's what Jesus said, Such, or then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time. Now, many people will take the word tribulation and they'll think about their lives and, you know, I don't know, you live, live the, walk a couple days in my shoes and you'll know what tribulation is. I'm telling you that, that Jesus is telling you, you ain't seen nothing yet. You may think about the worst that Israel has been through. Go back to Germany and look at what Hitler did to them while six million of them were killed. You ain't seen nothing yet. You can look at uh, the 400 years that they spent in Egypt. You ain't seen nothing yet. There's coming a day where it's going to be worse on Israel and anyone who dares claim the name of Jesus. And here's what Jesus said. He said, those days should be shortened. There should be no flesh saved. 
but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. I would take you to 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, and, and it says this, Let no one deceive you by any means. Now, Jesus tells us every time when he talked about this week is, Don't be deceived. Now, here Paul is saying the same thing. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And what happens? The man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God. The third temple, the one that hasn't been built yet. Showing himself that he is God. All this, my friends, happens after the rapture. That's what Paul is trying to explain here in 2 Thessalonians. In verse 6, he says, And you know what restrains him now. See, the early church knew the, what the Holy Spirit was all about. And what's interesting is sometimes as 2019 Christians, we get scared of this term, the Holy Ghost. Folks, th this, this is a gift that God has given to us. And if we are scared of it, and we don't allow the Holy Spirit to work in, in our lives, we're only hurting ourselves. And we'll probably feel like the church in Thessalonica and wonder, did I miss it? Or we may wonder if that's us singing the words to that song and hearing the words, depart from me, I never knew you. For the mystery of the lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. When will the Holy Spirit be taken out of the way? When will he stop restraining? At the time of the Gentiles' fullness. Just as he was given to the church at Pentecost, he'll be taken away and will not be used in that manner. And Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 24, For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders. Listen, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Now, you can um, decide what if possible means. You may say that if possible means that because we have the Holy Spirit and we're still here during this time period, that we won't be deceived by this guy that's coming on the scene. I would submit to you and, and be willing to argue this theologically is that it's not possible because we will not be here on the earth. And I want to introduce you to this person called Antichrist. You've heard about him and you can't turn the TV on today without seeing TV shows about him. But I want you to understand that the Antichrist is going to be more than just a political figure. I want to lay out through Revelation 13 many of the things. So let me just tell you what we're going to read in Revelation 13 and then we'll go through it. The first thing that you're going to notice is that the Antichrist is powered by Satan himself. Not only that, but you will find out that he will have a mortal wound and a miraculous recovery. Write this down, Zechariah eleven seventeen. Now, I'm going to read 15 through 17 to you, but I want you to go and study this on your own this week because here is a picture of the Antichrist. And it says, Then the Lord said to me, Take once more the equipment of a foolish shepherd. For behold, I am raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed. Why? Because he's the one destroying them. Or seek the young, or heal the maimed, or nourish the healthy, but devours the flesh of the fat ones, tearing off even their hooves. Now, verse 17. Woe to my worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. I believe that this Zechariah eleven seventeen here is talking about what's going to happen to this person that we know as the Antichrist. This mortal wound, I don't know what it will look like, but it will affect his arm. And listen to this, it says, Let his arm be wholly withered and his right eye utterly blinded. Now, this doesn't mean anything to us. But there are going to be people that are left and they're going to find this verse and they're going to recognize that that's the person that everybody in the world is worshiping right now. And they'll have a decision to make. We continue to read through Revelation 13. We're going to see that the followers of this person, the Antichrist, will worship Satan. Not only that, but you'll find out that this guy is what I call the blasphemer in chief. Daniel 7.25 said it best, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. 
He shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and he shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a half a time. That's the three and a half years. You see, his dominion is going to be limited to 42 months. You'll also find out that he is going to make war against the saints, and he's going to be victorious in that. Why? Because the Holy Spirit that used to restrain no longer restrains. And you'll see that he has authority over the entire earth. Folks, things are going to be different when the church is gone. Things are going to be different in America. It's going to be different in Europe. It's going to be different in Israel. It's going to be different in Africa. You won't be able to go anywhere on this earth and it not be different than what we know today in 2019. If you would, open up your Bibles to Revelation 13 and let me read with you. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. This is the blasphemer in chief. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. See, that's where he gets his power from. To, to be honest, I don't believe that this is a, going to be a human man. I believe that the, the, the Antichrist is going to be much different and much more powerful than any human ever. Verse 3, it says, One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Folks, here's what's interesting. When you, you read the word Antichrist, a lot of times we think it's opposed to Christ. Maybe a better reading of this is the false Christ. Because what you're going to see happen is the Antichrist is going to try to replicate everything about the Messiah. And so would it surprise you that it is going to uh, have a mortal wound where he appears to be dead? Uh, anyone want to guess how many days that he'll probably be dead? Yeah, that's what I think. And his mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. In verse 4, and they worshipped the dragon. Now, is the dragon the same thing as the beast? No, it's not. The dragon is very specifically identified, and it is Satan. It is the prince of the power of the air. And this, this person that comes on and takes over governing the world is going to lead them all to worship Satan. And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Now, what's interesting is a lot of times we see that commandment. It says, Do not take the Lord's name in vain. And we automatically, in 2019, associate that with cursing. But you know, there's a lot worse ways to take the Lord's name in vain. Maybe to call ourselves a Christ follower and yet live a life that doesn't represent our Christ. To call ourselves Christians and yet treat people wickedly. That is what it looks like to blaspheme. That's what it looks like to take the Lord's name in vain. And so here's what's interesting is we see the Antichrist and we see horns and we see a red guy and we see someone who looks horrible. But the Bible tells us that it's not that way. He is going to be accepted by everybody. He is going to be what we've heard of Satan and that uh, an angel of light. And he's going to be destroyed, killed, and he's going to come back. And I believe when he comes back, he's going to have a withered right arm. And he's going to have an eye that's darkened. You'll see more about this later. In verse 6, it says, It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Folks, he's going to be blaspheming the church that has been pulled out. You know they're going to make fun of us when we're gone? Your family that gets left behind is going to make fun of you. The government's going to make fun of us. All the organized religions around the world are going to make fun of us. And they're going to come up with a, a, an answer to what happened to us. And it won't be the truth. 
Verse 7, also it was allowed to make war on the saints and listen to those last words and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. I don't know if you, how much you are into technology, but if, if you get a chance, Google the term singularity. We are on the threshold of this term called singularity. And what that means is, I don't know about you, but has anyone ever seen that, that the program years ago was called um, Dragon Speak? And so, like, you could talk into your microphone, and then it started typing on a Word document for you. Well, now you can do it to your phone. They've got Siri. Or you can do it to this little box called Echo and, uh, what's her name? Alexa, yes. Some of your watches are about to go off. There's coming a technology to this world that is going to allow us to speak to somebody of a foreign language, and they understand instantaneously what we're saying if you go back to the tower of babel what was it that made them so powerful they had one language folks that day's coming back that is what the antichrist will use to establish his power i believe that's exactly what is going to be used to keep us from doing business if there's somebody who doesn't accept the mark of the beast in verse 8, it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. In verse 9, If anyone has an ear, let him hear. There are going to be people that have been left behind. And they're going to open up the scripture. And they're probably going to come across this verse right here. And this is going to be a very sad verse for them to read because in verse 10 it says, If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. But Revelation 13 doesn't just introduce us to this one antichrist. It introduces us to another character. One that we call the false prophet. You're going to find out that when the church is taken away, that ecumenism is going to take over this earth. You're going to find out that, I mean, right now, there are religions that are diametrically opposed, and yet they're coming together. And, and beyond that, what's very interesting is that you're going to see a rise in the occult and Satanism. I just want to read an article to you um, Dated April 18th, 2019 from Huffington Post. The title of the article is Satan is Having a Moment. It says a new documentary chronicles the rise of the Satanic Temple, a modern pseudo-religion fighting to stave off an increasingly evangelical U.S. government. Satanists, it turns out, listen to this, are everything that you think they're not. They're patriotic, charitable, ethical, equality-minded, dedicated to picking up litter with pitchforks on an Arizona highway. That much is clear in the fantastic new documentary, Hail Satan, which chronicles the rise of the Satanic Temple movement that has little to do with its name. It was founded in 2013. The organization is equal parts, listen to this, modern day religion, political activism, and cultural revolution. This should not surprise us because this is what Revelation 13 is telling us the Antichrist is going to do. And they will take Satanism, they will take Hinduism, Buddhism, and what some people used to call Christianity, and they will bring these all together in a one world religion. And this false prophet is going to lead everybody under this one world religion to worship who? Satan. Folks, it's coming. In verse 11, read with me in chapter 13 of Revelation. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns, like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. And listen to me. The reason why is because it gets its power from the beast. It gets its power from Satan. And makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. 
And when this happens, this is where the scripture tells us that all of these miracles that the false prophet is going to do, all of these things that are happening to this world leader, the Antichrist, is going to convince everybody, and it would convince even the elect who know better, if it were possible. You see, things are going to be different here on earth. Verse 14, and by the signs that is allowed to work in the presence of the beast. Listen to me. It's allowed to work these because the restrainer is no longer restraining. In the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image, listen to this, the image of the beast might even speak might cause those who would worship the image of the beast to be slain. Think about this. You know, um, if you go back to the book of Daniels and it talked about that there was a a idol that was built and the um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and everyone else had to bow down and worship it. And obviously they didn't bow down and so they got thrown into a fiery furnace. Well, there's coming a day where there is going to be an image of the Antichrist built and the technology is going to exist that you don't have to be in Israel where it will be it will see you you will hear it speak and if you don't worship it it has the ability to kill you where you stand verse 16 also it and this is the false prophet causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. I wonder why they choose the right hand. So that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. I encourage you to join us uh, this Tuesday night at 7 p.m. and I'm going to go in deep into this thing which is called the mark of the beast. Verse 18, this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man. And his number is six, six, six. You know, the world has taken that and they've run with it and they've mocked us and they've laughed at us. But there's a day coming when the laughing will be very serious. When the laughing will cause people their eternal souls. And here's what I would tell you today and what I've been saying every week, and that is this, that we must make sure of our salvation. I've showed you this many times and it's the are you and then ready? Are you ready to stand before God? Are you ready? The biggest question that most people ask when we talk about this is can a person be saved during the tribulation? Well, the answer is very clear, yes. But let me tell you this, that after the rapture of the church, the Holy Spirit is going to continue to work, but he is no longer going to hold Satan back from doing what Satan wants to do. And Satan wants nothing more than to destroy every soul that he can get his hands on. And here's what it means for us. If we are not taken in the rapture, to believe means our death. And it, and it doesn't mean that you just die. It means that you will have to maintain your belief in the Savior. And because of that, they will kill you. So the answer I give to you is, can we get saved in the tribulation? I don't want to find out. And folks, I'm here to tell you that you don't have to find out. Because as I shared with you last week, one day, the father is going to tell his son, go get him. And there's going to be a door that opens up and Jesus Christ will be standing there. And all of us that are saved will hear the trumpet Those who are dead in Christ will rise and we who are alive will be in the twinkling of an eye. Meet them in the sky with our Savior. And then we will go on to a thing called the wedding feast and I'll share that with you soon. But before we get there, I want to leave with you these words that they gave to the, that John gave to the Philadelphia church through the words of Jesus Christ. And it says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. 
As you read through the book of Revelation, and I hope you are doing this on your own. Why? Because Revelation 1-3 tells us that those who read it, those who hear it, and those who live it will be blessed. I want you to be blessed. And as you read through, you're going to hear this term called the earth dwellers. Those who dwell on the earth. Many times, over and again. And, and there's another group that you hear is called the saints. And there will be saints that are developed through the, this tribulation time. But almost all of them will be martyred. They will give up their life for the name of their Savior. You know, today we don't have to do that. We've been given warnings in 1 John 2, 18. John tells us, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. He goes on in verse 22 of uh, the second chapter, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. And then in his next book, 2 John 1, 7, he says it this way. This is the one you need to hear. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the, the deceiver, the Antichrist. Church, time is running out on us. Ephesians 5.16 tells us to redeem the time because the days are evil. And the evil that is coming, we do not even understand. And it's because the days are evil, it's because the restrainer has been removed and is no longer restraining, that we as the church in 2019, today on July 28th, need to start making some decisions. If you are here today and you do not know if your salvation is not sure, you need today to make sure your salvation. I'm about to open up the altar. This is not a time for you to let pride keep you. This is a time for you to know. Because you may show up here one Sunday and most of us aren't here. And the world's going to tell you something else. And the path to salvation is much harder during that time period. Maybe many of you have, have made sure your salvation. You have asked Jesus Christ in your heart. But you've never taken that next step of believer's baptism. Next Sunday, we are having a baptism here at our church. I encourage you, if you have never taken that uh, step of obedience, to demonstrate to the world. See, it has nothing to do with your salvation. It's showing outwardly what's happened inwardly. I encourage you to take that step. Join us. Enter into the baptistry and, uh, and demonstrate what Jesus Christ's life did. And maybe you're here and I would challenge you that you need to be saying these words. Put me in the game, coach. It's time for us to get busy for our Savior. If you've looked at the handouts that, that we've given you, you'll see that next week we are starting the pastor's breakfast. 9.45 on Sunday morning, I'm going to sit down and I, I want to help all of us know what our role here at Temple Baptist Church is so that we can have a part, so that we can live out our passions, out our gifting by God, live out our purpose in our lives to help transform the Centralia area for Christ. Folks, it doesn't happen just by coming here on Sunday mornings. God has a bigger plan for you than you've ever imagined. And I would encourage you that after the service that you would go and find one of the sign-up sheets. We're only having six spots in each one. And I would encourage you, put your name down there. And then show up and see and hear how you can make a difference. If you would, bow your heads and close your eyes. And maybe you're here this morning. And your salvation is not sure. I'm about to lead you in a, uh, the sinner's prayer. Folks, it is not this prayer that will save you, but rather what's happening in your heart. And so if I were you, I would just repeat these words after me. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. And I'm asking Jesus Christ to come into my heart, to be my personal Savior and the Lord of my life. 
Amen. Look at me, everybody. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, 10. It says, through the heart, we believe unto salvation. See, we could say those words as many times as we want. But if it's not from the heart, if we did not believe that, we have not made sure our salvation. But if that's you today and you've made sure your salvation, I encourage you, come and share this with me. Allow me to share this with the church. As a church, it's our honor to play a small part in all that God is doing in and through your life, and we would love to continue with you on that journey. To find out what your next steps could be in your relationship with Christ, simply go to www.tbccentralia.com forward slash next. You see, here at TBCC, it's our mission to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Christ who walk by faith and not by sight.